My name is Joe, and in part one of this video, I talked about target curves and why a generic target curve wouldn't work. I went into some definitions about the transition region and directivity index, and I want to show you in detail why these generic target curves don't work with some measurements and other experiments. I'll be talking a little bit more about my Magic Beans app and how we approach the situation and how we can arrive at a target curve that is more conducive to what you probably want for your room. So first I'm gonna talk about some in-room measurement techniques and why I believe these are in some way superior to the anechoic measurements for room correction specifically. It's different when we're talking about speaker design. This is specifically for room correction where the speaker is actually in your room. And so I'll go into detail about that. We'll talk about the effects of using an incorrect target curve again with some objective measurements to show what that does and then i'll jump more into the specifics of how magic beans does what it does to arrive at its target curves and then we'll show some examples of that versus a generic target curve and how that may sound to you so first let's talk about in-room measurements now typically in-room measurements are taken at the main listening position in which case it's not that useful in a sense because you are getting the combined response of the on-axis sound as well as the reflections in the room. And so they call that a steady state response. And so it's really hard in a typical scenario to separate out what the speaker is doing versus what the room is doing. But for the Magic Beans True Target app, it's a little bit different because we do take near field moving mic measurements. And this is different from what other people are currently doing. Other software, they're just typically taking multiple sweeps at different listening positions. And so you may find yourself doing maybe 12, 16, a bunch of different measurements in various seats, and then they take a spatial average. With the moving mic method that we use, we're actually taking a near field measurement of the speaker in room, as well as a measurement at the main listening position. The reason I believe an in room measurement is superior to an anechoic measurement when it comes to correcting for that speaker is because a speaker in a room does have nearby reflections that do interact with the speaker and so those, I believe, need to be taken into account. For example, if you have a speaker right next to the wall, that wall acts as part of the waveguide. If you have a speaker that's right up against a back wall, that's gonna affect the bass and cause bass reinforcement because the speaker is so close. Now, these things would not be a factor if you're taking a look at the speaker's response anechoically, but I do believe that those are things that we should address with room correction. So first, I wanna show you a comparison between an in-room measurement using the moving mic method that we use for Magic Beans and compare that with something from the Clipple. And I'll be using this Arendel 1723 speaker just because we do have Spinorama data from Aaron at Aaron's Audio Corner. And it's a pretty basic setup. All I have here is a U-Mic 1. I'll be using my laptop with REW. And then I have it connected to this mini DSP DDRC88A. Right now it is set to bypass, so there's no filters at all. And I just have it hooked up to this Fosse Audio ZA3 amplifier. So right now I'm gonna do a near field measurement of the speaker. So there is the measurement that I just took just now. Let's compare that to one from Aaron's audio corner where he took a measurement of the same speaker on the Clipple. So here's Aaron's measurement of that same speaker. I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop the one that I just took into this photo editor and I'm going to have to scale it so that it's the same. So there it is above the transition region here. You can tell that there's a pretty good match. There's the clipper one and there's the one that we just took. Now here in the base region, this is going to be very different because the room is starting to take over. So now let's EQ this so that it's flat based on this near field measurement. So here it's created a few basic filters which I'll export to the mini DSP. Okay, so there it is. All right, so now that I have the filter applied, theoretically what we expect to happen is that when I remeasure this, it should be more flat near field. And we can see here that that is in fact the case. So let me go ahead and apply some psychoacoustic smoothing just so you can see it a little bit clearer. So this one is afterwards. Okay, so now that we know that we have a speaker that is EQ'd flat, not necessarily anechoically, I'd say pseudo anechoically because it's still an in-room measurement, but as you can tell above the transition region, there's definitely uh, a lot of similarity between that and the anechoic measurement. So what will happen if we place this in a location that's suboptimal? A lot of times we have speakers in our room 
and they're kind of close to nearby surfaces. I've seen people say that all you need to do is correct based on the anechoic measurements, but I believe that we really need to take into account all the different things that are nearby because that's really what happens in a room. So if you look at my actual home theater setup, normally this is not here, but my speakers are not in optimal location either. They're very close to a rear wall and the rack is right next to it. Kind of the same with this situation over here, not optimal. Let's just kind of simulate that with these boxes, see if it still measures the same. So looking at the after measurement in red, this is with the box nearby. You can see that there's this dip here. A lot of the higher frequencies still look about the same, so that's kind of good. But you can tell that there's a difference in the base region here. So there's definitely a difference just placing that box there versus without it. So this can also affect a speaker that's behind an acoustically transparent screen because that does affect the higher frequencies so you should account for that. Now I wanna show you the effects of using an incorrect target curve. We'll take a look at the measurements that we've just taken of the near field, and let's compare that to what happens after we use a generic target curve. So this DDRC88A does have Dirac, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that. So here I have the mic about six feet away from the speaker. Ideally, I would wanna place it further, but there's no room behind here, so this is what it is. Dirac wants the mic facing upwards. Okay, so for this, I'm just gonna keep it on the default target curve that it sets here. So Dirac is currently on. Let's go ahead and take a measurement and see how it measures at the listening position versus how it measures near field. Let's just give it the benefit of the doubt and apply some psychoacoustic smoothing. Okay, so definitely does some weird stuff, but the high frequency roll off looks like what it predicted. Not sure exactly what's going on here. Let's go ahead and measure near field and see what Dirac did to the near field response of the speaker. Okay, so if we take a look at what Dirac did to the near field response, this is what you get. Now, if we compare this to the near field correction that we did prior, you can see that the other one in green is much smoother than what Dirac did. But what happens if we compare it versus uncorrected? So this is the near field response before Dirac did anything. And as you can see here, it's smoother. It definitely fixed some of this extra high frequency response here, but look at what it did over here. And that's the issue that I have with it is it kind of made the response worse. Definitely not as good as the near field correction that we just did. Even the one where the box was nearby had a smoother response than what Dirac did to it. And this is not exclusive to Dirac. This also happens with Odyssey and other room corrections that I've tried. Keep in mind that these other room correction softwares that only measure at the main listening position, they can't really separate out what the speaker is doing. So they don't know. They don't know what the speaker itself is doing and therefore they're only correcting from the main listening position. But you can see here why that's an issue. So just for fun, let's see what happens with Magic Beans, what it does for the main listening position and what it does to the near field response. Okay, so determine that this is the true target curve for it. Let me go ahead and export this. Export to the DDRC88A. All right, so I'm back at my desk here and Magic Beans can export what we call a speaker export that shows you what it's taken as far as measurements. And so this is what it took for the near field response. If we compare it to the actual near field response that we took, you can see that it tracks pretty well. And here's the main listening position measurement that it took. And here is the directivity. We call it the speaker in-room directivity. And if we look at how that compares to the response, we already saw that the on-axis measurement tracks well with the clipple data. If you look at the directivity, most room correction doesn't take the directivity into account when applying corrections, but we do. As you can tell, we have directivity information that tracks well with the clipple data above the transition region as well. So the transition region for this particular speaker in this location at this distance seems to be somewhere between 501 kilohertz. And below that, you see that the room really just starts taking over and it's not similar to the anechoic data whatsoever. So using these various measurements, we're able to come up with our true target and this is what it is. And after EQ, this is the response that we're able to get from six feet away. You can see that in the higher frequencies, especially it tracks pretty well. So if we compare that to how Dirac measures from six feet away, you can see it has a different high frequency roll off because it's just guessing. Uh, here it looks okay, but there's a lot of ups and downs. And here in the mid range, I don't know what it's trying to do. So let's take a look at the near field measurement. So this is the uncorrected near field. We already saw Dirac's effect on the near field response. 
But what happens when we use magic beans? This becomes the near field response in orange. So you can tell that it's a much flatter response. If we compare this to the manual near field correction we did prior, we see that above the transition region, it tracks very well. What this shows is that our correction for magic beans does not destroy the near field response. So the main listening position measurement tracks the true target. And at the same time, it's keeping a nice smooth near field response. If we take a look at these with some psychoacoustic smoothing, just to simplify things, you can see before and after. So the way that magic beans works is we take that near field measurement we also take the measurement at the main listening position using that moving mic average, which in 10 seconds gives us about 60 measurements. It's a spatial average of the space around your main listening position. The fact that we have both measurements, near field and far field, means that we can see the effects of the room. It also means that when we measure various speakers, we can start to see the transition region and we can start to see the difference between the near field responses and the main listening position and where the room itself starts to take over. With that information, we can provide what we call a unified sound field EQ target curve, which EQs the higher frequencies differently than the lower frequencies. So for the higher frequencies above the specified transition region, we are EQing the speaker to be more neutral near field and whatever that does far field is a little bit different because it's going to depend on distance like we talked about in the first video. So the roll off that we will get at the main listening position is really dependent on the distance and your specific room. And so we're not guessing at what that roll off should be, where it should start. We're actually taking a look at the measurements and finding that out directly. Also, as far as the bass rise, we are able to determine that specifically from the measurements. So we're no longer guessing whether it should be 5 dB or 10 dB or 15 dB or 0 dB. We can actually look at the measurements and see what the room is asking for as far as a bass rise. Now, of course, we want to smooth that out. So if there are any small dips or peaks, we want to smooth that out. The other thing that's important to notice about the specific bass rise is where the bass rise starts. And that's going to be different for various rooms, depending on the room size and how far you are from the speakers themselves. So that's it for part two. In this video, we talked about the benefits of in-room near field measurement. We talked about the impact of using generic target curves and how that can ruin the response of a good measuring speaker. We also showed how the Magic Beans app arrives at its true target curves that are specific to each speaker in your room. And in a future video, I wanna talk about why a neutral near field response is the correct response and how reality is our reference. So that's it for this video. If you liked it, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos, all that stuff. And if you're interested in any videos that are related to this one, check out these here.